Hello, my friends. Welcome to week three of season seven of Be Formed. This week, we're going to be looking at the Eucharist is Apostolic. Presenting this week will be Bishop Conley, Bishop James Conley from the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska. I met Bishop Conley at a retreat about two years ago, and uh, we've become good friends, and we've had the opportunity to walk St. Cuthbert's Way together, uh, Northern England and Southern Scotland. He was a baseball player at one time, and so we connected on that. So let's listen to Bishop Conley as he talks about the Eucharist as apostolic. Hello, everybody. My name is Bishop James Conley. I'm the Bishop of the Diocese of Lincoln in Nebraska. And it's a great privilege to be with you for this presentation. I want to thank my good friend, Father Burke Masters, for inviting me to participate in this uh, Be Formed series. I understand this is season seven of Be Formed, and we are in week three. And in this um, season, we are taking up the Eucharist, which is very appropriate because we're in the midst of a Eucharistic revival in our United States. Uh, the bishops in, in this country have called for a three year, we're about halfway through it, we're in year two, of a three-year Eucharistic revival. Uh, an opportunity and, and an initiative to represent, you might say, in a more beautiful and, and forceful and um, um, compelling way, the great gift of the Holy Eucharist. And to bring people back to the Eucharist if they've fallen away and to bring people who, who are not Catholic into the church uh, and share with them this great gift that we have that's been given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're taking up the encyclical, the great encyclical, by St. John Paul II, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, his last encyclical, um, and sort of like the crown of his whole pontificate, I think. Um, but I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I didn't grow up as a Catholic. I grew up as a Presbyterian and didn't convert until I was a junior in college in my undergraduate years at a big state university. And um, I made a few pit stops along the way in different faith traditions. Uh, my family, half my family is Baptist and the other half is Presbyterian. And we landed in the Presbyterian church just because my mom liked the preacher and it was close to our house. Um, so I'm not... I was not leaving a, a tradition that I was very wedded to in the sense that I, I didn't grow up with much religious formation. But we did go to church um, on Christmas and Easter, maybe. Um, and we were a, 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 a Christian-believing family. Um, but it wasn't until I was 20 that um, I was introduced to the Catholic Church. And I have to say at the outset that it was really coming to an understanding of the Holy Eucharist and what the Catholic Church teaches about the Eucharist. That the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian faith. We'll hear that expression a lot. It comes from the Second Vatican Council. But it's, in essence, the representation of the redemptive act of love by Jesus on the cross. Pure and simple. That the Lord instituted the Eucharist the night before he redeemed us the night before his saving death on Good Friday. So Holy Thursday, he gathered his disciples together, his apostles together, and he gave them the Eucharist, um, the Eucharistic sacrifice. And then he completed it the next day on the cross. So that every time we come together to celebrate the Eucharist, it's the representation of the Paschal mystery, the saving mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. It's the same sacrifice. We enter into that mysterious time and, and space, uh, eternity. We, we are, we're in contact with eternal things when we come to Mass. And then he invites us to come forward and to have Holy Communion with that love, love made visible, Love made visible through the sacramental signs of bread and wine, which then are transubstantiated 
consecrated through the words of the priest so that they become no longer bread and wine, but they become the body and blood of Jesus. It was that mystery, that truth of the Catholic Church uh, that convinced me that I needed to become a Catholic. And it was also chapter, John, chapter 6 of John's Gospel, um, the Bread of Life Discourse, where Jesus tells the people that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And up to that point, I believed that it was all a symbol. Um, we had communion in the Presbyterian Church and in the Baptist Church, but it was never taught and never believed that it was really and truly the body and blood of Jesus. It was simply sort of a memorial, a reenactment, which was fine, and I, and I accepted that. But once I understood what the Catholic Church teaches about it, that it's, it's more than that, that it really becomes what Jesus says it becomes, then I had to become Catholic. So I can say that it was the Eucharist that brought me into the Catholic Church, and it's the Eucharist that will always keep me a Catholic, that I would never leave the Catholic Church, because I would never leave Jesus. So with that little introduction, uh, let's get started. Um, the section I've been given is chapter three, um, and I guess this is week three of our sessions. And this is entitled, this chapter, you know there are basically six chapters in this encyclical. There's an introduction, bookends, an introduction, and a conclusion, and then six chapters. And the third chapter, the first chapter was the mystery of faith, which you've already gone through. The second chapter is the Eucharist builds the church. And the third chapter is the apostolicity. It's kind of a hard word. The apostolicity of the Eucharist and the church, which I think it's important. He puts that in. It's the apostolicity of the Eucharist and the church. In other words, the apostolic nature, the apostolic nature of the Eucharist. Um, and in chapter three, there are eight sections or eight paragraphs, numbers 26 to 33. And I'll touch upon each one briefly um, and try to pull out some major themes, um, but I'm not gonna go through and parse out every part of it. I presume everybody's read uh, the assignment, or if you haven't, you can go back and read it on your own, so I'm not gonna read it to you, but I will quote a few things that I think are important. So number 26 is the first uh, paragraph in chapter three, and it's on the apostolic nature of the Eucharist in the church. And it's interesting because Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II begins by reminding us of the nature of the church. He talks about the four marks of the Catholic Church. And when I became a Catholic, this was something also that had a big impression on me, that the Catholic Church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. And John Paul II quotes the Catechism and reminds us of that. And then he says the Eucharist is also one holy Catholic and apostolic. And, and because the Eucharist is the Church, comes from the Church, and it builds the church. So it would make sense that if the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, so the Eucharist is also one holy Catholic and apostolic. And so just as the church has four marks, so the Eucharist has four marks. And he, and he says there's, and we, now he focuses on that fourth mark, the apostolic nature, one holy Catholic and apostolic. Why is it apostolic? And what does it mean to be apostolic? Well, he says the three ways that the Eucharist is apostolic. And of course, the easiest, first obvious way is that it goes back to the apostles. You know, that uh, Jesus gave the Eucharist to the 12 apostles the night before he died on that first Holy Thursday. And he entrusted the Eucharist to the apostles. The apostles received it from him. He gave it to them and they received it and they were entrusted with it to be the stewards of this great gift, to be the stewards of these mysteries, um, to protect it, to advance it, to celebrate it, to spread it. And so in giving them the Eucharist, then he commanded them, do this in memory of me. 
In other words, don't just keep this to yourself, but do this in memory of me until I come again. So that the Eucharist will be celebrated until the second coming. And that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years. But it was given first to the apostles. So that's the first point he makes. The second point he makes is the Eucharist belongs to the church. That is, it's given to the church through the apostles. And then it's up to the church, the apostles and their successors, who are the bishops, and we'll get to that in a second. Those were the first bishops in the church, the 12 apostles. The church then is entrusted to explain it, to teach it, to develop it, to be true to it, to protect it, to advance it, and to teach it in every age. So the church is really the custodian of the Eucharist through her bishops and priests. And the church then has the duty to continue to, to explain it, to develop it. That's why what happened that first, first, first Thursday, first Holy Thursday is not what we see today in 2023. The essence of it is there. The words of consecration are there. This is my body this is my blood but the the the, the language is different um you know, we say it we say it in english jesus didn't speak english although he could have because he was god but it wasn't invented yet um and then it's it's down through the centuries and it's a fascinating story to see to, mm-hmm. a fascinating thing to study the history of the mass from the very beginning until we what we have today um, it's, it's been celebrated in many different languages. Of course, Latin, the language of the church, is really the has primary place. It's always the the fundamental language of the church, the Latin liturgy. Um, but it's celebrated in the vernacular and all over the world, in 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 every every language and in every country and every village. Um, but it's the church that's entrusted uh, to to take care of it, protect it. Um, and to keep it true to the apostolic roots. Again, there's that apostolic nature of the church. Um, and it evolves, it changes. I mean, we had big changes in the Second Vatican Council, as you know, it went from Latin to the vernacular. Uh, but we still retain the tradition. We still have the, the traditional Latin mass, um, which is very important to preserve. Um, it's sort of the, the, the foundations uh, of 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 the of the apostolic tradition, and then the third point about this apostolicity is that um, the apostles were the first bishops, as I mentioned, and they handed on this power. Not just anybody can celebrate the mass. You have to be entrusted with the the power to confect the Eucharist, and that power was given first. And power maybe is not the best word, but that that authority. Uh, given first to the apostles, who then handed it on to their successors, the first bishops, who then ordained priests to continue and work with them as their collaborators, so that um, the the Eucharist then was was celebrated by those who had the authority and the ordained power to do what Jesus did. To do what Jesus did. And that's really what a, pers- a priest does in persona Christi. And I'll talk about that in a minute. What does that mean in the person of Christ? So I'd like to quote um, number 28, um, where the church is apostolic, and this is that third sense again, that church is apostolic in the sense that she continues to be taught, sanctified, and guided by the apostles until Christ's return through their successors in pastoral office. The College of Bishops, assisted by priests, as I said, in union with the successor of Peter, the successor of Peter, who is the Pope, the church's supreme pastor. And he says, this succession is essential for the church to exist in a proper and full sense. In other words, this succession is the link back to the apostles. That's why the Eucharist is apostolic. So it goes on to number 29. And now he kind of drills down a little bit and focuses on the ordained priest who is ordained in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, as we said just a minute ago. A validly ordained priest speaks 
in the person of Christ. He doesn't speak in Jesus' name. He doesn't represent Jesus in the sense of like an ambassador. He is Jesus. That's why when he celebrates the sacraments, he uses the first person singular. This is my body, not Bishop Conley's body. This is my body in that sense of persona Christi. This is Christ's body. I absolve you from your sins. The priest is not absolving you. The Christ is absolving you. I baptize you. I baptize you. Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the sacramental identification, Pope John Paul II says, the sacramental identification with Jesus Christ on the part of the priest is a huge mystery and is essential for the confection of a valid Eucharist. The ordained priest is the sine qua non, that is, of the Eucharist. In other words, the Eucharist can't happen without an ordained priest. It just, it just won't, it just won't work. Let me quote 29. In persona means in specific sacramental identification with the eternal high priest, Jesus, who is the author and principal subject of the sacrifice of his. It's Jesus who's offering himself to us. A sacrifice which, in truth, nobody can take his place. The, the priest stands in persona Christi. The ministry of priests who have received the sacrament of holy orders in the economy of salvation chosen by Christ makes clear that the Eucharist, which they celebrate, is a gift which radically transcends the power of the assembly, the power of the congregation, and is in any event essential for validly linking the Eucharistic consecration to the sacrifice of the cross and the Last Supper. So the priest is the link being ordained in persona Christi to the sacrifice on the cr cross on Calvary and to the Last Supper. And without that link, there is no Eucharist. In other words, you could say, without the Eucharist, there is no church, which we learned in chapter 2. And without the priest, there is no Eucharist. That's how important the priest is to the Eucharist and to the church. Again, this ecclesial apostolic nature of the Eucharist, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, you know, that's the whole theme of this encyclical is the Eucharist and the church. So going on to number 30, what about ecumenism? How do we reach out and relate and evangelize those from other faith traditions? Well, first of all, we have to be true to our Catholic faith. We can't water down what we believe about the Eucharist to think we can make it more inviting or less um, exclusive. We have to be true to what we believe, and we can't pretend that other traditions are the same. So, like I said, I'm my whole Catholic, my whole family is not Catholic, um, but I've had a lot of funerals for my relatives, aunts and uncles, cousins. I just buried one of my cousins, my first cousins, um, who ap who actually converted to the Catholic faith. So he had a Catholic funeral. But most of the funerals I've celebrated have not been Catholic, and I haven't said mass because you know they don't believe in it. They don't. They don't. They don't accept the mass, or they don't understand it. And so we have um, a nice, you know, a liturgy, uh, but without the mass. Um, so just as you know, we wouldn't go receive communion in a Baptist church or my Presbyterian church where I grew up because we'd be dishonest. We would say, we'd sort of be faking it. Okay, I believe what you believe. No, we don't. We, we have a different belief and that wouldn't be honest to them if we went ahead and received communion at a communion service in a Protestant church. Same way, if they came to our church, we couldn't give them receipt. We couldn't give them Holy Communion um, because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be honest because we don't have that union, that communion of faith. They don't believe what we teach and we don't believe what they teach and so until there's full communion we can't invite them to receive um, that my family all came to my ordination they come to my masses they know they don't receive communion that's okay 
they come up with their hands crossed i give them a blessing um some of them converted some of them are in the midst of converting some probably will never convert but we have to be honest with ourselves and 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 respect that you know they respect their tradition and they respect our tradition um, I'd like to quote um, from number 30. The Catholic faithful, therefore, while respecting the religious convictions of these separated brethren, must refrain from receiving the communion distributed in their celebrations, be Baptist or Presbyterian, so as not to condone an ambiguity or a confusion about the nature of the Eucharist, and consequently to fail in their duty to be a clear witness to the truth. We have to be true to our own belief. And by doing that, we believe that others will see the truth of our faith and may be attracted to it, like I was as a, as a Protestant growing up as a college kid. Um, and then it goes on to say, the fact that the power of consecrating the Eucharist has been entrusted only to bishops and priests does not represent any kind of belittlement of the rest of the people of God. For the communion of the one body of Christ, which is the church, is a gift that redounds to the benefit of all. In other words, sometimes we think that we're being offensive by not allowing people to come and receive communion at mass. No, we're being respectful. We're just being truthful to what we believe. So, going on to number 31 and this is important it's all important if the eucharist is the source and summit of the christian faith then it must also be the source and summit in the life of a priest in other words the eucharist must be at the heart of the life of every priest i remember um in 1979 john paul ii came to the united states and I was just out of college. I'd just become a Catholic a few years earlier. Didn't know what to do with my life. I was dating a girl and thought maybe I was gonna get married. And we went to this big outdoor mass in Des Moines, Iowa, October 4th, 1979, I remember very clearly. And I remember being at this mass, seeing the Pope for the first time. This was the newly elected Pope from Poland, John Paul II. Nobody really knew much about him. It's his first trip to the US. And I remember being at that mass him celebrating the Eucharist um, as a new, I was a new Catholic. I can remember during that mass, my call to the priesthood. I wanted to do what he did. And it was the Eucharist that drew me. It was the man himself. I mean, he, you couldn't help but be impressed with him. He was, you know, John Paul the Great. But it was what he was doing, leading us in the celebration of the Eucharist that I thought for the first time in my heart, I want to do that. I want to lead people to Christ through the Eucharist and to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Um, so I, I'm one of many who attribute their vocation to John Paul II himself. Uh, I'm a John Paul II guy, and, and, and he, 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 he was everything to me. Um, so let me quote again from number 31. Priests are engaged in a, in a wide variety of pastoral activities. So a priest does a lot of stuff, right? Um, you know, he, he visits the sick, he comforts the dying, he preaches, he teaches, he serves the poor. Those are all great things, and we can all do those things. But only a priest can celebrate the Eucharist. Priests are engaged in a wide variety of pastoral activities. If we also consider the social and cultural conditions of the modern world, it is easy to understand how priests face the very real risk of losing their focus amid such a great number of different tasks. The Second Vatican Council saw in, a, in pastoral charity the bond which gives unity to the priest's life and work. This, the council adds, flows mainly from the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is therefore the center and root of the whole priestly life. Now, an interesting thing is a priest is not bound by obedience to say Mass every day, but most priests do. He takes a promise to say the breviary every day. He takes a promise to be obedient to his bishop. He takes a promise to be celibate, but he doesn't take a promise to say Mass every day. And the reason for that is because sometimes it's impossible. 
uh, missionary priests just don't have the, the means to celebrate Mass every day. So they wouldn't bind a priest out of conscience to say the Mass every day. But most priests, most priests do. Um, and, and this helps to develop a Eucharistic heart, a heart of Christ, a heart of self-sacrifice and gift to his people. So finally, we're going to bring this plane in for a landing. What happens when there's no priest available? Um, like in missionary territories, or there's no vocations, or the priests have disappeared. Well, you can't have the Eucharist. And there's a great story about Catherine Doherty, who grew up in Russia. And she talks about as a little girl, they came in, the Soviets came in, the Russians came in and killed their priest and drug him out. And they didn't have mass anymore. There was no Eucharist. But the faithful would get together and she remembers that the men of the parish would would get, they go to the church and they'd all sit there and they would read the prayers of the mass. But then when they come to the consecration um, and they would read the scripture readings, they would sing. But when they came to the consecration and because there was no priest, there would just be this silence for the words of consecration because there was nobody to say them. And she remembers as a little girl sitting next to her mother, her mother would weep during those quiet moments, knowing that there was no Eucharist. They didn't have Jesus. And it wasn't until years later that they got a priest back after the Soviet uh, fell, and then they, the, the Eucharist was now restored to their village and they had the Eucharist again. But the, the, the community couldn't make the Eucharist. Only the priest could. Um, and there's a beautiful quote about that in number 32. When a community lacks a priest, Attempts are rightly made somehow to re remedy the situation so that it can continue its Sunday celebrations. And those religious and laity who lead their brothers and sisters in prayer exercise a praiseworthy way of the common priesthood of all the faithful based on the grace of baptism. But such solutions are only temporary while the community waits for a priest. And then in the last number, 33, that develops a hunger for the Eucharist which would motivate us for vocations to bring priests in when we need priests in communities. And there should be that hunger for the Eucharist. So I know I've gone over a little bit, um, but let me just lead by, finish by saying that the Eucharist is apostolic. It comes from the apostles. Uh, it's protected by the church and it continues through the successors of the apostles. So that when you're sent out from mass, you're sent out to spread the the gospel to the nations and the last words of the mass the mass is ended in latin is ita misa est go in peace and that means to be missionaries and that's where the word mass comes from misa ita misa est go out go out and tell the good news and continue the work of the apostles that is the apostos, apostos, <laughs> apostolicity. That's the apostolicity of the Eucharist. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Bishop Conley, for that great uh, lesson on the Eucharist is apostolic, the Eucharist sending us on mission. Uh, don't forget to check in with your prayer partner uh, this week, working on your commitment card. Remember, taking one step closer to Jesus each day. The Lectio Divina this week will be Luke chapter 22, verses 19 to 20. And be aware of the graces, uh, those moments of grace where you encounter Jesus uh, during the week. Have a great week. God bless you and buen camino.